Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's Liz Mullins here, uh, and on behalf of Governance Evaluator, can I thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Um, we've uh, got a number of people online, and I suspect as it's just after 3 o'clock uh, Eastern Daylight Saving Time that um, others may join us, so if that's the case, uh, that's welcome. Um, if you have a any questions, then uh, you can indicate uh, a question uh, by typing it in. I have your names uh, on my screen, unfortunately, or fortunately for you, my camera's broken, so uh, you'll just have to imagine what I look like, uh, which I can tell you is absolutely better than the real thing. Um, so did you want to say welcome as well? Yes. Hello everybody and welcome to our expert webinar today. Thank you so much for coming and Lizzie, thank you so much for being our guest presenter today. We're looking forward to hearing um, all about your tips for clinical governance and I might hand back to you and I'll keep an eye on the questions as well and see what people might like to ask during the session today. Uh, thanks Fee. So what I thought I'd do today is given that uh, Many of you are on boards or have responsibility to boards that I pitch this uh, as something that funnily enough is relevant to you in relation to um, why it's not simply around safety equality but there's a, a very real and harsh financial reality about why uh, providing safe and effective care is a good thing to do which may be important for those of you who don't have a, a clinical background or maybe for those of you who do have a clinical background to understand why um, this is a, one of your dreaded win-win-wins for, for everybody, the organisation, the staff and the patients. Um, so I'm hoping my next slide. So if I was to ask you uh, the principles of risk management, uh, and I was to ask a group of you um, what's the greatest threat to aviation safety, you would typically say things like pilot error. Uh, increasingly, you'd be concerned around terrorism. Uh, you might be concerned about um, a mechanical failure or possibly even um, mechanical failure. Um, but quite clearly, as you could see, the greatest single threat to aviation safety is gravity. And I guess that's really telling us that risk is inherent in the systems in which we work, whether we manage it or not. And so whether we want to or you want to manage the risks in your organisation is entirely up to you. The risks are there. The opportunity is for you to how you actually go about managing them uh, before they become too much of a problem. And that really focuses us on understanding that the management of risk is an active process. Uh, to also understand that healthcare is inherently risky, that information that we see provide to our community can't be seen as threatening to doctors because it would be my view that they are the most significant stakeholder in all of this actually working and that's not out of a, uh, a patriarchal um, view of the world but simply a very pragmatic view of the world. If you can get your medical staff on site and on site uh, and working in partnership with you, be it the board or the organisation, uh, then the hurdles to overcome in terms of effective uh, systems and processes uh, are greatly reduced. Um, but part of being able to manage this risk is to understand the risk. Uh, and that's where those of you who aren't clinicians need to know that you can absolutely understand the risk. Healthcare is actually relatively straightforward. People talk about it being very complex. But at its heart is a, a, a logistics process. Uh, and once you understand what the logistics ought to be, then identifying where those logistics fail um, is the stuff of solution and something you can all be part of. Now, as you can see for the next couple of slides, we've got plenty of systems and we've got plenty of frameworks. Uh, and they change. I'm old enough to remember when it was quality assurance. Uh, and we're talking about CQI, I can remember TQM, I can remember when the Australian Standard 4360 was all about the world. I'm old enough to remember life before EQIP as accreditation. Uh, and now we're living through 10 standards, going to 15 standards, going back to 8 standards. So we've got plenty of frameworks uh, and we've also got plenty of data. And uh, it gets more and more complex and can get more and more granular. Uh, but in fact, uh, we've got all of the things we need to do to make it better and to get it right. The question clearly is therefore, uh, do we manage it as well as we should? 
and the evidence would suggest uh, uh, that in fact um, we don't manage it as well as we should. Australia is pretty smug about its healthcare system and if we look at ourselves versus other OECD countries we do pretty well, we don't spend too much, our general quality of life for patients is pretty good. Uh, we have a nationalised health service, we have a pharmaceutical benefit screen, scheme that means patients get medications without going bankrupt in the process. We have well-defined primary care systems, we have a grasp of community services, um, but we still have a one in seven people coming into our health services uh, and certainly in our acute health services having a one in seven chance of an adverse event. So it's a very interesting question that despite the smartest and the brightest in the land and investment in lots of this, I'm not sure we manage it uh, as well as we should because if you look at other industries that manage risk, uh, be they transport, petrochemical, civil engineering, munitions, coal mining and power generation, they spend far more per widget on managing risk than we do. Uh, so that uh, within transportation there are very strict guidelines and requirements and legislations around what you can do. Ditto with petrochemical, ditto with munitions, uh, coal mining uh, is, in, is less risky than it was but a decent coal mining catastrophe becomes front page news all around the world. So we understand that uh, and those organisations go to a great deal of trouble to manage their risk uh, and put serious dollars around all of that. Uh, and the question is of course who does it? So BHP Billiton do it. Volvo do it, Qantas do it, and everyone's always a little bit dodgy around Flying Tiger because we're not entirely sure that they manage risk quite as they should. So if we work through um, which, why do they manage risk, uh, it's very simple because a breach of their duty of care has serious and far-reaching consequences. So when they stuff up, hundreds of people can die. In some situations, thousands of people can die. In some situations, generations of people will feel, feel the um, impact of poorly managed management of children or other risks environmentally. So they have an immediate, very real uh, financial, social and reputational risk that they manage. What happens to us in healthcare, however, is that we kill our people one by one that we have a large number of private and individual tragedies that are in all of our health services. And it doesn't matter whether you're a small rural health service or a quaternary teaching hospital, um, there will be individual tragedies and system failures and poor practitioner behaviour and events that simply should not have taken place happening all the time. We're better at identifying it. Uh, most of this generation of doctors and nurses and allied health staff will learn about open disclosure as part of their normal way of life. And for the rest of us, we've done courses and have had it explained that when there is a bad outcome or an unforeseen outcome, we're much better now at explaining to people what's going on. Uh, but they seldom occur in large batches. Now, I say, I say this sitting in a little place called Bacchus Marsh in, um, on the peri-urban fringe of Melbourne. Uh, where if you Google Bacchus Marsh and Stillbirth or Jerawarra, which is the name of our health service, I've been here for the last two years as the Director of Medical Services um, on the back of 11 stillbirths that occurred between 2014 and 2015 that the organisation, 13, 14 rather, that the organisation seemed not to notice. Uh, and boy, was that public. Was that full of front page news just as if an airplane went down or there was a bus crash or there was a terrible petrochemical spill in a river. Um, but that's unusual. Although we have a fair number of public tragedies, we have many, many more people who die in our healthcare systems or who have serious adverse events uh, as a result of what's going on that people never know about. And as a result, there isn't stockholder, stockholder or shareholder demand for what's going on there's not outrage because they occur one by one. But as I said, when they occur more than one, there's certainly huge outrage. So why is this? Well, we're still professionally autonomous as doctors, nurses and allied health staff. I'm registered with the Medical Board of Australia. Uh, there's nothing to stop me starting my cosmetic surgical clinic down the road if I buy the equipment and people are silly enough to come to me. Uh, we're not drug tested. We're not urine tested. Um, 
we certainly get into trouble if we're drunk or drug affected, uh, but that's not screened regularly as it may be with the transport industry. Uh, we have a relatively low level of regulation compared to the military, compared to people working in power stations, people driving out trucks. Uh, and the other balance to that where you might hope there was a degree of empowerment of our consumers, well, we fix that because we take off all their clothes and put them in paper knickers uh, and ask them to put a, um, a white gown on uh, that doesn't do up both sides. And I always feel very sorry for the patient who walks in and they've done up their gown with the bows at the front rather than the bows at the back because you know that they're not going to do terribly well. We put our patients in beds, we look down at them and they're particularly disempowered. And I think we've all found that either as a patient or as a relative of a patient uh, that we in fact uh, to try and fight doctors and nurses and the hospital system is not an easy thing to do. Uh, and so as a result the degree of professional autonomy is not balanced by particularly informed consumers when they're sick and frail and elderly and frightened, which is most of our patients. And then the last piece that I think is important you understand is that there is a pernicious relationship between risk and demand. We in fact create risk within our service. Not only do we have to manage external risk, but we actually create risk by the numbers of adverse events and failed systems that occur in our healthcare every day. And this is one of the reasons why um, we're unable to invest properly as other services do in risk because we're too busy actually sorting it out. And I'll share my thoughts in relation to this. At the heart of our health service is the patient provider relationship. And that can be an individual patient or a client with an individual provider, a clinician of some sort. It can be a patient and a ward or a health service or in fact a health system. Uh, and ideally the patient goes through this system uh, and is treated well and has a good outcome. Um, what we know however from studies here and in the United States that uh, one in seven patients in an acute health service will have an adverse event. Uh, and we know that half of those are avoidable. So it's not simply about being frail and elderly. Uh, there's actually a, a, a system-based problem uh, where we don't do things as, as we should and that creates adverse events. Uh, what we then do as a result of those adverse events is that we fix them. So we have unplanned resource utilisation. So for the little old lady darling who's come in and her delirium risk wasn't assessed and they've had their procedure and they're now mad as a hatter and they're running around and they're vicious and violent uh, and they're hitting nurses and they need drugs and then they're going to get more concerned and then they're going to hit a few more people. Uh, that uh, requires sedation, it requires an anaesthetist, it requires a nurse to sit with that patient for 24, 36, perhaps even 48 hours until their delirium passes. Uh, and that's all coming out of the ward's budget or the nursing staff's budget. If someone has a little trip to the high dependency unit because they've had the wrong drug, and they need to be monitored for 24, 48 hours, that's coming out of someone's budget. That's not based on the activity coming in through the front door, through the emergency department, or coming through the elective surgical suite. We're actually creating our own demand and raising our internal costs because of the adverse events. And if you look at this and think of this as a figure of eight, I'm not quite clever enough to make this look like an active figure of eight, uh, then you'll see that in fact what we know from studies here and overseas, the longer you are in hospital, the greater your chance of an adverse event. The single biggest predictor of a second adverse event is a first adverse event. The older you are, the more likely you are to have an adverse event in hospital. And the older you are, the more significant the adverse event is likely to be. And we've all worked in intensive care units where Many of the patients come through via the emergency department, but an awful lot of them come through medical and surgical wards where they've basically had second rate care that's resulted in all sorts of problems that the intensivists need to sort out. It's interesting, for many years the single biggest source of complaints against doctors was from intensivists uh, who were able to uh, report poor behaviour and poor practice to the medical board because of what they saw, not externally, but from within their own services. So if we're to unpick the risks here, which you as board members are very interested in, the clinical risk is that which occurs between the patient and the provider. 
there's a liability risk for these adverse events. Not all of them are going to sue you, not all of them are going to become coroner's cases, not all of them are going to be the subject of a Health Complaints Commissioner inquiry or a Medical Board of Australia inquiry. Uh, but all of them will take some time and some talking. Some of them you may need to brief counsel, uh, get expert legal advice, get expert um, medical advice. It's interesting, I know the world's got complicated, but uh, when I started talking about this 20 odd years ago, uh, I think there was one hospital in Victoria that had a corporate counsel. Now there are three and four of them in large hospitals. So it was cheaper to employ lawyers to come on staff rather than give it out to other lawyers. Such was their need, not just for liability, I appreciate it for contracts and HR and other things. Um, but in fact, um, paying lawyers for advice and to manage systems uh, as a result of adverse events uh, is a, an ongoing and increasing uh, cost to the organisation. The financial risk, of course, is that of the unplanned resource utilisation. Unplanned drugs, unplanned staff costs, unplanned redos, unplanned returns to theatre, unplanned bounces back to intensive care because they were set out too quickly in the ward, didn't really know how to manage them. And it's interesting, and if there are any finance people in the room, I mean no disservice, but if a chief financial officer really thinks they're going to turn around the health services fortunes by reducing access to colour photocopiers uh, and stopping sandwiches for doctors uh, in the operating theatre at morning tea, uh, then they're whistling Dixie because there's only so much funds you can raise from increasing food and increasing car parking costs. The real issue, and this is for the finance people and the chief executives and for you as the board, is to understand that this unplanned resource utilisation is happening morning, noon and night. And if you were to reduce one fall out of bed with a fracture and the costs associated with that, conservatively it would be $100,000. That's a heck of a lot of colour photocopying uh, that you'd need to take to try and save that amount of money. So this is not my diagram. I um, was shown this in the United States 25 years ago. Uh, and I talked about it 25 years ago and it's always a source of interest to financial people who don't quite understand why they can't balance the budget. And they can't balance the budget because probably 9 or 10 percent of all the budget is coming from demand that we have created inside the organisation. So there's a big argument about safety and quality and caring for people and that's important. But from a straight up financial point of view, you need to get a handle on making sure that those adverse events, 50 percent of which are avoidable, are in fact made to not occur. And of course the subtotal of all of these risks is your business risk. Does anyone want to come to your hospital? Well, if you're the only game in town then they probably come. But can you recruit staff? Can you retain staff? Can you avoid reputational risk? Are you on the front page of your local paper for good reasons rather than terrible reasons? I can tell you having lived through the Bacchus Marsh experience for the last two years. It is just awful for a community when their health service and their hospital is on the front page of the paper. It's awful for them to see the Channel 9, 7, 10 and 2 cameras walking and driving through their town because of what's happened to, to, uh, to their patients. So it's an awful thing to have to happen. Uh, but in fact if we believe what Deming and Toyota told us, if we get it right the first time, then there's an enormous amount of money, cost, time, grief to be saved if we do it properly. And certainly there has been a change in attitude around the world in relation to this. We now talk about central venous line infections as being potentially zero. Three years ago we just measured them at 13, 14, 15, 16 percent. So this idea of tolerating or not tolerating any other than zero is a change that started in the United States and is coming through. It's also quite possible to do it properly. For those of you who have larger health services, you will know that in the intensive care unit, you have the number of beds you have available is wholly dependent on the quality of the nursing staff you have to fund those beds. My suspicion is the same is not the case for your emergency department. So in the intensive care unit there are very strict ratios, there are high quality pieces of equipment, there is access to real time data, there is access to pathology, 
Consultant ward rounds occur at least twice a day and there is always a consultant seeing the patients physically twice a day. In the emergency department, well, God knows what's happening. You have junior staff, you will typically have doctors who have not trained in Australia who are dealing with language barriers and unfamiliarity with the system, working in the most complex part of the health service, that is to say the emergency department full of people who have undefined and undiagnosed conditions. To be perfectly frank, sitting in the intensive care unit with a diagnosis, consultant twice a day, all the bells and whistles and very trained nursing staff, probably not too hard to manage. 200 metres away in the emergency department, it's often bedlam and chaos. So we know actually how to do it properly in our health service. For a whole lot of reasons, we culturally choose not to do that. So we in fact could get it right more often in the emergency department if we had trained staff, committed staff, reliable staff. Does it cost? Absolutely. But the trade-off is the number of serious adverse events we can reduce by getting our system properly in the very beginning. So in healthcare we need to manage the risk uh, uh, and then those others, if we manage the clinical risk, then the business, financial and liability risks take care of themselves. And that's because safe and effective healthcare in fact is our business. So clinical governance is in fact the governance of the healthcare system. It's not something that sits on the side. It's actually in any other industry would be called our corporate business because that's what it is. And people have seen, I'm sure, lots of these triangles. They're used for lots of reasons. Uh, and in reality, we've all gone through TQM, QSI, um, accreditation, EQUIP, uh, clinical pathways, clinical guidelines, protocols, uh, smiley badges that make us seem nice to people, badges that have our name on it so people know what our Christian name is. Uh, and they last a little while, although there's always one in the organisation that manages to keep the badge on from 15 years ago. We've done a bit in, uh, in anaesthetics with re-engineering and we can't really put CO2 uh, lines into oxygen lines or vice versa. But I wonder if uh, would be interested in your organisations within your operating theatres, be they big or small, whether all of the drugs are labelled, although, or do we have the traditional method of we all know what's in the two mil, in the five mil and the ten mil. They're not labelled, that's because we all know what's in it. And given they're clear and colourless, I would uh, suggest that uh, evidence would tell us from time to time there's a catastrophic problem with that when the wrong drug is given because it's frankly not labelled. So within a busy operating theatre, are things barcoded? Do we have a barcode scanner? So we have an oral as well as a visual cue. Uh, many of the drugs used in operating theatres look the same. They're in tiny, weeny, two mil vials that look similar. Uh, how do we store those? How do we make sure that they're done properly? Where in fact, I'm sure in many of your organisations, your day unit gets through an extraordinary number of people. Have you ever wondered how that's possible? Are they actually having a proper conversation with the anaesthetist? Are they being properly assessed beforehand? Are you absolutely certain that what they've had done is what's been done? But we have ever increasing demands for throughput and sometimes um, despite some re-engineering, uh, we make mistakes because it's too busy. And in fact what's needed is a cultural and attitudinal change that says we are actually going to do things properly. We are going to give guidelines and recipes for interns to follow. We are going to give them a task list to make sure they stay in the ward every morning. We are going to make sure that they know what to do, that the registrars know what to do, that handover between doctors is reliable and excellent and robust as opposed to, well, we won't take that on because the doctors get too cranky uh, and then we find out that someone's terribly sick at four o'clock in the afternoon. So the attitudinal change, I believe, that is led by the board is around investing in making sure that we do things properly rather than focusing on how many colour photocopies we can stop. Uh, at the moment when we manage clinical risks, there's always an investigation uh, and we usually tell the person who made the mistake not to make the mistake and they say, I'm terribly sorry. Uh, there's a few tears and then sometimes we tell people not to do what they were doing, although they probably knew not to do it in the first place. Uh, and in the old days you could actually get rid of staff, that's increasingly difficult. Uh, you usually tell people not to give the wrong drug and they say they won't give the wrong drug and, and uh, as I said a few more tears and off we go. 
but we've learned and done very little uh, about situations in which we put our staff uh, where perfectly good people uh, make terrible mistakes. And I've always been impressed with the quality of stuff up that occurs in tertiary teaching hospitals that small rural hospitals can only dream of in terms of how dreadful um, the event has taken place. So even with the cleverest people, the most professorial units, uh, the pick of the medical, nursing and allied health students, the best equipment, tertiary teaching hospitals can do stuff ups to an extraordinary and dare I say Olympic quality. And what's that about? It's that we put good people in a position to make mistakes. And, and part of what I, I think is important for you to understand is that bad people don't just make mistakes, good people make mistakes as well. What we need to do is understand why that happened. And I'm a, a fan of a man called Reason because why wouldn't you believe a man called Reason? Uh, and Professor James Reason was probably at his height of his powers in the late 90s. Uh, where he has this accident causation model that I don't have time to go through, but I suggest you go to the British Medical Journal, April 2000 is their patient safety issue, hard to believe it's 17 years ago, uh, and read his editorial in relation to why good things, bad things happen to good people. And it's all about us putting people in a situation where they'll make a mistake, where the protections we have to avoid mistakes fall apart, uh, as a result of a local climate, a corporate climate, uh, and we have these um, we have these problems. Uh, and in fact, when you go back and look at them, it's very rare that our staff weren't trained. It's very rare that staff didn't know what to do. They just were in a situation where the ward is chaos, there is no system, they're doing things they're not trained for, they're supposed to be supervising, they're meant, trying to do three and four things at a time. We've got doctors overnight being in charge of 400 inpatients uh, because it seems cheaper just to have one person overnight. So funnily enough, they can't get to anyone other than the obviously sick. Uh, and so by 8 o'clock in the morning, the people who've been quietly exsanguinating overnight uh, become discovered. And you wonder why there are so many code blues at about 8.15 in the morning. Uh, typically, it's because the patients have been very sick and no one's noticed it until the morning shift come on. So we have an opportunity to try and learn why these things happen. And for those of you who receive uh, reports on incident reviews, and I'm sure you read them, you'll probably see things like create more education programs, council staff, create a policy, you might reassign some duties, have a bit more training, the unit manager, she'll fix it all, uh, we'll create a few more forms, uh, and that tends to be the action sheet from what's going on. Uh, but in fact, we still have no clear roles and responsibilities, there's no robust system of care, communication's poor, there's no real accountability, junior staff don't have real support, the equipment's old, it's depressing at work, staff are pretty angry, untrained staff are doing things that they shouldn't do, uh, there are no reliable resources, people are, often have unhappy home lives, there are too many patients, the managers have not been trained and aren't terribly good at what they do, uh, we're all too busy, we feel undervalued, we get picked on every, every time we do something wrong or we don't get any praise when we do things right. Management are changing again, we've got new logos, we've got new mission and vision statements, the doctors are cranky, the patients are demanding and the rosters, new mission and vision statements, the doctors are cranky, the patients are demanding and the rosters uh, come out of uh, 1964. Um, but if you look at what your... Um, Many of your quality staff will suggest is the solution are all the things that I have, have listed. And sadly, that does not get to the root of the problem. Far better that after there's a serious adverse event, you clarify roles and responsibilities. Who is supposed to do what 24 hours a day, seven days a week? What is our system of care? What patients do we look after here? What cases do we take care of? What is our capability? And not on a good day, but every day. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Funnily enough, hospitals get busy and there's not a hospital on earth that doesn't have beds on a Monday morning. I'm here to tell you that happens 52 weeks a year every Monday morning. So what do we do to manage um, access to beds over the weekend? Not a lot in the last 30 years, not a lot in the last 50 years. Uh, but in fact, we should have a plan for being busy because we know and can predict when we're likely to be busy. What's our communication like? Well, we now give everyone a hospital email address 
and that's terrific and organised, except doctors don't use their hospital email addresses, so they don't get part of the communication. And we might demand that they use them, but in fact what they do end up is not knowing what you're trying to tell them. How do we get reliable resources? If we have an escalation process, who really does help us out? If there is a real problem, does the consultant come in? Does the registrar, are they too nervous to call the consultant? Does anyone call the Director of Medical Services when they need some advice? The rosters are born out of 8 till 5 or 8 till 6, and in fact none of the patients come in until 1 in the afternoon. So do our rosters better reflect our reality so people can be used more effectively? We do very little training of our middle management. Uh, most people get to be in charge because they're either good or they're old, uh, and that's just a fact of life. In any other industry, our nurse unit managers and our divisional and de departmental heads would have significant time and effort invested in skills and management training. Uh, we don't do much of that. Uh, we need doctors to get more involved. Uh, for many in, in executive, uh, doctors are, are quite tricky and best to be avoided, really. Um, because they are smart, they ask difficult questions and they give a, a different view of things. Smart organisations listen to their doctors. They're patient with their attitudes but they hear what they want to say. Uh, their vested interest is almost invariably in patient goodwill and they know the systems of care that will and won't work but they're often not involved. We ask them to come to meetings and we don't pay them. We pay everyone else who comes to a meeting but we don't pay our doctors. And the fact that they make a good income I don't think should be a reason why they're not reasonably compensated uh, for in fact attending a meeting or at least as a gesture of goodwill to offer to do that. If you do that, you bear fruit. Uh, now what I can't do is help people's home lives. There are always going to be too many patients, although having said that, um, if you don't have enough patients you've got a real problem. Um, it's always going to be busy and management will change all the time. But if you actually look at the root causes of these problems, use a tool like the reason model, then you've got a better chance of sorting out what's going on. And there's some evidence around why this is a good thing to do. The Heinrich Ratio came out of American industry in 1941. Uh, and it's a 1 to 30 to 300 type ratio. Uh, at the moment, uh, in many states, not so much now, but still in Victoria, we're spending an awful lot of time reviewing our major industry injuries, what we might call our sentinel events. Now they're important to look at, but the problem is the patient's dead. We can't do anything about that. And we're dealing with grieving families and utterly traumatised staff. The real focus and what I suggest you as board want to know are these serious injuries uh, that didn't cause death, but just for the grace of God or system or luck or whatever it might be, didn't turn into that. So you should not be waiting to see rare and unusual sentinel events. You should be seeing at least two serious adverse events every month so that you can start to see that people are looking at where things didn't go well. In smaller hospitals you mightn't have quite that many, but in fact when we simply wait for the absolute catastrophe, we're missing the opportunity to learn why these less serious ones didn't become serious ones. And it may well be because there was an after hours coordinator who was trained and intervened. It may well be that the nurse decided to call the GP in and the patient was saved. This is where we learn much more around what's going on than simply focusing on rare and obscure sentinel events which by their very definition should be rare and obscure. Uh, mind you, you don't need more than one infant to be abducted to know you've got a problem. Um, but, uh, and, you don't, and you don't want to wait to have a maternal mortality to know that you may have a problem with the management of postpartum hemorrhage. You will know this by looking at your serious events and my suggestion is these need to be collected really regularly to tell you what's going on. So in real life what we do have is my vision of, of I guess clinical governance. These are all of the inputs to care. We have a person in need who goes through our system and then comes out. And these are not terribly sexy and they're not terribly exciting, but boy, when you have a serious adverse event, they are what is the framework on which we are caring for our patients. So we need to know what standards we're using. We need to know that they're contemporary. We need to know that mandatory training has happened. In our situation, we don't have anyone who works in our birth suite who is not a level three 
F step through the College of ONG. Well, certainly not in charge of <coughs> as a midwife, and all of our doctors have to be F step level three. That's our minimum standard for working in our birth suite. That's the minimum standard at the women's, and we see no difference to that being the minimum standard in our small hospital, and it should be the standard for you. Does that cost money? Absolutely. But I can tell you it's a much easier conversation to have with a family who've lost a baby or had a terrible outcome to be able to say that the organisation invested in training and something awful has happened, but we can say hand on heart our staff knew what to do. Uh, when I did the open disclosure for the women in relation to Bacchus Marsh, I unfortunately had to tell them that our staff weren't all trained uh, and that the missed CTG abnormalities contributed to their baby's death. And that's a very, very difficult conversation to have. So these bits of the care need to be done. We then learn from what's going on to see whether any of that worked. And so we don't simply look at outcomes as an esoteric or a benchmark. It's all about whether our system of care worked in the first place. And by looking at these and linking them back to what should happen, the old fashioned quality assurance, you as board members will have some certainty that what is in place is in place uh, and that uh, the staff and the executive are accountable to you to give you that reassurance. So not bad things are going to happen in healthcare all the time. It's the nature of what we do. But what you as board people want to know are that the systems and processes are in place to, with a bit of luck and a following wind, give very good outcomes for patients rather than hoping that they're going to be all right. And if you can do that, then that works well. And that, that ingredient comes from you as leaders. It's about having a clear plan. It's making people accountable to do what they're meant to do. So for those of you who run a maternity service, I would hope you've read you and Wallace's report. It's still available on the um, DHHS website, which speaks very clearly around the risks of inadequate um, perinatal assessment of fetuses and their viability. And you need to know who in your organisation is trained to read CTGs and they need to be a level that is acceptable. It's interesting though, the College of ONG who send out the certificates still simply say that you have completed the program. It does not on the certificate say whether you are level three, two or one. That comes in a separate piece of paper. So if people are giving you their FSET certificates, that's all very nice, but what you want to know is what level they are. Because there's a world of difference between knowing something 65% of the time or 95% of the time in terms of reading a CTG. Does that always guarantee that it will protect a baby's outcome? No, but it certainly makes me sleep better at night that we've invested in staff knowing what's going on. And this needs to be part of routine activity. It's how we do business. We need to make sure before the operating theatre starts in the morning, are we good to go? Do we have enough staff? Are we aware of what blood's in the fridge? Are we clear on where the um, difficult intubation tray is? Simple things like all of the cupboards in your health service, are they labelled? Because if you work in the wards, you don't need to label them. I don't label my kitchen cupboards at home. I worry as I dement further, I may need to do that. But at the moment, my kitchen cupboards aren't labelled because I know what's in them. Um, I would ask you to ask very gently whether all of the all cupboards in the health service are labelled so people know where to find things. Because in an emergency situation, they need to do it. You need to ask if things don't occur very often, what do we do in terms of practice? If you're in a small rural health service, God forbid you don't want too many code blues, which makes it difficult when you do have one that people know what to do. And people talk about reliable organisations and they go through and they practice and they rehearse for predictable situations. And that's the sort of routine activity that is going to be important and keep people motivated about what's going on. I have this book by Jim Reeves and he has autographs for me at home. And he talks about not being able to change the human condition but to change the condition under which we work. And, and you and your, as a board can give strategic leadership to investing in staff to get it right more often. This was a landmark study in 1991 about adverse events in US hospitals. They came out with a rate of 3.4%. When Ross Wilson in 1995 did the Australian healthcare study, ours was 14.6%.
The Institute of Medicine report in the year 2000 showed that the biggest single cause of accidental deaths in the United States comes from medical error. We now talk about clinical governance, which had its beginnings with Margaret Thatcher in a way of making sure that organisations were accountable for improving the quality of their services through accountability and a systematic program of quality improvement. In Australia, we did a lot of good things. We've done a lot of very good things in relation to this. Um, the Australian Council of Healthcare Standards is an old and august organisation. This slide throws, shows the growth of us being early adopters in terms of wanting to improve, learning from the United States, investing in what's going on. We had privileging standards and open disclosure and sentinel events. All states by 2010 were monitoring incidents and we have ongoing commitment with organisations. Unfortunately, at the same time, we've got disasters happening across the country, whether it's in maternity service, neurosurgery, general hospital failure, um, inappropriate nursing behaviour overnight, rogue surgeons, um, in, inappropriate management of trauma, uh, the whole of New South Wales health system, um, deposit, um, substituting fentanyl for lolly water in the ambulance service, babies dying in Rockhampton at, at Jerrawarra, underdosing of chemotherapy and medical gases. This is all happening at the same time as we've got this commitment to what's going on. And as I said personally, this has been a, 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 an awful thing to live through, a wonderful thing to try and fix. Um, so in Australia, what have we got? More data, more adverse events, same disaster, different people, more staff. Uh, and our leading safety initiative is we still can't convince people to wash their hands properly. So if you go back to that pyramid, that cultural commitment to safety and quality uh, is really challenging. The core of our business is to manage that risk. Uh, and if we look after our risks, as I said earlier, um, we should do it right. But are we really serious? And I'd ask you to look down your hall in finance, and that's the sort of number of people you'll see in finance. All got a chair, all got a desk, all got a computer. Um, in the safety and quality unit, there might be one desk and there's invariably someone who looks like this, uh, who is flat out trying to do <coughs> the very best thing for any number of services in the health service. Why do we spend more money on finance and safety and quality? Well, it's because we have a budget and a budget's big and important and we can count it. It has months of planning. Um, one might say that for most organisations it consumes the organisation a couple of months a year. We have internal and external audits and reviews and there's lots of IT support. Could we say that for your quality and safety unit? Could you say that for your investment in IT in relation to what's going on? Where's the power budget equivalent in your health service for safety and quality data? If you're a large metropolitan hospital, you've got it. If you're a small hospital, no chance, very little. How do your people know about their outcomes if we don't look at it? Finance is easy. You're in, if you're in the black, you're lucky, and if you're in the red, you're unlucky. Um, Organisations can be compared by dollars, and in Victoria, you're on watch principally, not for safety, but usually for financial reasons. If you look at KPI data, this is old data. It's not terribly exciting. Doesn't it impact the surgeon or the anaesthetist, the num, the physician or the psychiatrist? And yeah, the ones who are overseeing the system that's creating all these adverse events. What does this data mean for them? Well, not very much because it's usually written for the board. It's a high level um, rolled up situation. But do they get their own data about their own patients and their own services? Often, too not. How do we make them understand? Well, typically this would be a chief executive engaging with their executive, frustrated over what's going on. For their sins, the medical staff group aren't always helpful. This is a typical medical staff group meeting. Uh, and in the middle of some perfectly lovely directors of medical services or the like, trying to do what they can, looking as smart as they can uh, to try and bridge the gap. What we need is a clinical balance sheet that links clinical outcomes with financial cost to benchmark where we are and where we need to be and the cost of those adverse events. We need to colour code them and I know this is old fashioned but boy, if I'm a board member, I'm worried about the red and I'm happy about the green. And I'm a little bit nervous where there's so much yellow. You need to be able to get this information reliably and reasonably based on a benchmark 
and an explanation about what's going on. We need to define from a clinical purpose what it means to be in the black and what it means to be in the red to be able to have that clinical balance sheet, which will help us do our job. So if we go back to, as I said, my colleagues in America years ago, at the heart of all of this is the patient-provider relationship. The reason it's hard to balance budgets and to invest in things is that we have so much unplanned resource utilisation. The cost is in liability, cost is in dollars, cost is in patient um, demise and tragedy and doesn't really help us with our budget uh, in terms of our business. So I share this with you today really to say that as board members, finance and clinical care <coughs> are not different. They're part of the same issue. You have a great opportunity to um, inform and see what's going on. Uh, and um, I'm very happy to take any questions or comments. Lizzie, it's Fee here. I had a, a question that someone um, mentioned earlier and they said, where does the community fit with our approach to clinical governance? How can we involve them better? That is, before people come to hospital and what are some of the suggestions you have for working? Well, I think, I think the community are the, the mm. source of the patient mm. um, and they're also proud in their health service. So we need to make sure when we listen to complaints, we really listen to complaints. Mm. We need to make sure that we make complaints easy for people, um, uh, where we can actually um, uh, hear what they're saying and, and do everything we can to um, learn from those complaints. Um, typically complaints to a board, uh, a single sheet of paper, it may be reduced to numbers if you've got so many of them. Um, the stories are lost, the stories are really important because they speak to the impact that some of these situations have had on people's lives. Uh, I would certainly, if I was, uh, and we do on our, on we have our quality and safety meeting, we have a story that relates to something we've done well and we have a story that relates to something that we don't do well. Chief executives are very keen to show the board that we're doing things well and we do do things well. Um, but I do think that um, uh, we need to be very honest about sharing that and making sure that making a complaint in a health service uh, is not an arduous situation. It's not so long ago that complaints were never taken seriously unless they were written down. It's just a nonsense. Um, if people want to make a complaint, senior people need to hear about it and what they want is for you to actually do something about it. That's very good. So, Lizzie, you yourself, in your role and, and where you are now, what key things have you seen change in this board? What, what things have um, shown leadership and, and started to make a difference? At Jurawara? At Jurawara. From, the, from the, you as a medical director, from a governance perspective? Well, we have an administrator. We still don't have a board. Okay. So, um, but what we do have is a rigorous um, accountability system for committees where we feed information up, we feed information down, um, where all of us have our roles and what's expected of us, that the committees that we chair, we have expected outcomes of those committees. Uh, I'd have to say that they are all now very well attended, we have good medical input, uh, and there is in fact a genuine commitment to doing things better for everybody. Mm. Uh, but the background for that, or the structure for that is, I believe, uh, an excellent clinical governance or a corporate governance system where there's accountability up and down. We have external people who come in. We don't look at our own neighbours ourselves. <clears throat> so on our safety and quality board, we have an external person. We have external persons attending our uh, obstetric meetings, our anaesthetic meetings, our perioperative meetings, um, and, um, so that, and our finance meetings, so that we have external people who are experts. We also have consumers on almost all of our relevant committees mm. for the same reason. They bring fresh eyes, they bring, um, and, and many clinical people get nervous about it. Well, they ask the difficult question, they ask the obvious question, uh, and the combination of all of that I think works very well. 
Um, mm -hmm. I've got a question here. What advice do you have on balancing the board role and responsibility versus operation management role? Uh, well, it seems to me that the board sets the strategic direction to say we want a safe and, and, and quality healthcare service. And what you need from your executive and managers is the evidence of that process. You don't necessarily need to look at what the instant reporting form looks like, but you would want to know about how complaints are being managed. You would want to know the time in which they're being managed. You would want to know if there's a serious incident that is being reviewed. You would want to know that those activities have a timeline to be fixed and sorted out. So I think to an extent the board, is it's tricky not to be too operational. But if one of your strategic initiatives or strategic um, one of your strategies, in fact, is to provide safe and reliable health care. You need evidence so that you can ensure yourself that, in fact, that's taking place. And that requires you having explanation of data and explanation by an individual event, which is another way of looking into the system. That's good. Lizzie, um, it was interesting the other day I was talking to someone about what's a really quick and easy way for a board to pick up that they're focusing too much on finance and not enough on quality. And they said a really simple way is to count how many times the finance committee meets versus how many times the quality yeah. committee meets. And they, we did a really quick review and it was quite box smacking. Yeah. Financial meetings are always 12 times a year, always regarded as something that can never be changed. Quality committee meetings are often only four times a year. Hmm. I don't understand how you can have a quality and safety meeting four times a year. Yeah. It's quite interesting. I don't understand. Because even if you're a small organisation, um, you've got all of the risk of a big organisation with not a lot of the infrastructure. Mm. So if you're delivering babies and you're delivering 60 babies a year, that's not a lot of babies to maintain skills and activity and um, um, evidence and contemporary care. Uh, I'd be wanting to look at all of that very carefully. Yeah. Um, and I think... Uh, the example of the number of people in finance is no disrespect for the finance, but um, there's not a finance person that doesn't start work without a desk and a computer and a phone. Um, there are a number of larger hospitals where doctors start, they don't have any of that. Yes. yes. Uh, and so I think it's about really being clear that in fact if you want to improve your financial outcome, you need to get your healthcare right and you need to get your processes right and that requires a degree of investment. Yes. And that's a really good message to finish up our session today. Liz, thank you so much. It's a pleasure. And I know, I'm just looking at all the comments here and um, it's been a fantastic talk and insight. And um, thank you very much everybody for coming today. And we'll follow up with um, a copy of this for everybody and a copy of the presentation as well. So Liz, pleasure. thank you. That's wonderful. Good afternoon everyone. Bye.